a shower just for this video, self-care. So today we're going to be talking about self-care, your own self-care as a clinician or a student clinician on placement. Good morning, good morning future OT. Good morning everyone, it's Tuesday. Good morning everyone, I'm in a car full of OT students. wearing my glasses for this video so sorry if there's some um, glare just makes things so much easier when I can actually see <laughs> as always I'd love to hear your opinions and for you to join the conversation so down below leave your advice your experiences and your tips for everyone else to read let's jump into it so today we're going to be covering a lot of things so I'll list the timestamps down below but firstly what is self-care and how does it relate to our work as OTs or student clinicians? How it might be assessed when we're on placement as students? Also, the impact of poor self-care, what the warning signs might be, some positive strategies, as well as some advice I've gathered from my fellow students, or more recently, recent graduates of occupational therapy. So firstly, what is self-care? Self-care looks different for everyone. There isn't a specific amount of time or frequency we should be engaging with it. It's about allowing ourselves time to participate in activities that support and improve our mental and physical health and well-being. It's important to note that self-care isn't an emergency fix, but instead is best utilized when we've integrated it into our schedules so we are maintaining a positive well-being. So as OTs or OT students, we're often talking about self-care, self-care occupations with our clients and their families all the time, but it's imperative for us as clinicians and as people working with these clients for us to take care of our own self-care. As a profession, we're constantly giving to our clients and their families, which can deplete and diminish our energy levels. So it's really important for us to be able to replenish and restore our own energy levels to achieve these positive clinical, educational or whatever outcomes for our clients. It can also reduce our ability to be attentive and present with our loved ones as well as our clients. Many healthcare professions, including ours, can be quite demanding physically, mentally, cognitively, and so require us to recognize and understand our own physical and emotional well beings. Our ability to look after ourselves is actually in the OT Australia standards. Standard one recognizes and manages his or her own physical and mental health for safe professional practice. Safe and professional practice. What can we expect when we're working as clinicians? Sometimes a lot of grief, sometimes very heavy conversations, sometimes things that might remind us of something quite emotional in our own lives. Sometimes we might not know exactly what to do in that moment and that can feel quite overwhelming. As new graduates, it can feel like an impossible challenge to be the best employee this company's ever hired and get as much done and get amazing clinical outcomes for your clients and you think maybe taking a break for yourself doesn't really fit with that goal of being the best new graduate they've ever had. When we're older we might have families, we might have competing commitments, we might have a lot of different sources of stress. When we're older we might be taking care of our own parents as they age. All the way throughout our careers and our lives we're going to have competing challenges which can put different amounts of stress on ourselves as clinicians, partners, daughters, members of a netball team. As students, how might we be assessed on our self-care or our stress management whilst on placement? Well, for example, your clinical educator might look to see if you are appropriately engaging in debriefing after maybe stressful conversations or situations you've been in whilst on placement. So that's being able to reach out to your supervisor or whoever is appropriate in your clinical setting and setting aside time to debrief and talk through what you've gone through and put some strategies in place or acknowledge strategies that you already have in place. They also will look for whether you're reaching out in an appropriate and timely manner 
with work-related or personal issues. If you're really struggling with your caseload, they'd rather you tell them as soon as possible rather than keep pushing yourself to the extreme and collapse at the end of placement. They want to know what's going on for you, if it's going to impact your work and if you need some support or guidance. Yeah, yeah, so like what could happen if you have poor self-care? Well, you can appear quite disengaged, you can not be present in the moment, you can be distracted, very <laughs> distracted, you can become passive aggressive, irritable, these are not things that I'd hope you would bring to a client session or a family meeting. And you can become overwhelmed and perhaps tear up in the middle of something and feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. You can feel rushed and frazzled. None of these words I would associate with the best clinician you could be. It can also come across as reduced capacity for compassion with your clients and their families, but also your friends and family. When you neglect your self-care, Remember that you're modeling self-care in a lot of ways for other people, whether it's your family, your friends, your clients. If someone sees you not valuing your own self-care, they might model that too. And that's just perpetuating that cycle, this cycle that we live in of poor self-care, of sleeping minimal hours, pushing ourselves to the brink drinking too much coffee, working late nights, getting behind the wheel when we're exhausted. These all have detrimental effects on our own health, that's physical and emotional, but also it can involve someone else's well-being, especially when you get behind the wheel. So what are some negative coping strategies that people have in place? It might be doing certain things in excess, such as drinking, uh, drinking alcohol, overeating. It might be inappropriately seeking comfort and um, reassurance from the wrong people, for example, clients. It could be being in denial and continuously saying, I'm fine, I'm fine, I can take on more, I can take on more, but one day it's going to be too much. This is getting real sad, <laughs> but it's important, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Maybe I'll put some upbeat music in. <laughs> Trying to squeeze more and more into your day and schedule, leaving less and less time for breaks and to recuperate. You might isolate or avoid your colleagues or your friends and family. You might be a bit blasé to the current experience and say, it'll be fine, it'll work out. It could be fine and it might work out if you change your habits, if you reach out for help, so keep watching. We know that excess and persistent stress can be harmful to our physical and emotional well-beings. So it's can be quite a cycle when we don't have healthy coping strategies to reduce the stress and it just keeps building up and then some of these strategies are only contributing to that stress. What are some warning signs you should be looking out for in yourself, your friends and colleagues? I like to think of it as what are the main occupations of a child or a baby? They are eating, sleeping, play. Check in with yourself with all three. How's your sleep? Too much? Too little? Seven to nine hours? How about your eating? Too much? Too little? How about your play? Your leisure time? Your self-care? Not enough? Or just right? Have a think and check in with your own life and schedule. Do you have enough time scheduled for all those things? Do you take breaks at all? Yeah, I know, I know someone's going to be like, yeah, breaks, breaks, that's just like, you know, stealing time from someone. I'm not doing anything in my breaks. I'm talking about breaks that can increase your productivity, your effectiveness, and perhaps your efficiency, and make you a more compassionate occupational therapist. Whilst on placement, I think it's important to take breaks. It's good to establish maybe with your supervisor or your colleagues, When's the best time to take, take breaks? They might already have some kind of structure around it. Happens at a certain time of day. Or how to reach out when you know you just need a break. Something's going on, you just need some time alone. Or you need to talk to someone. Establish that early. It can be easier said than done to not compare yourself or be hard on yourself whilst you're on placement. Or I presume even as a clinician who's already graduated. You see other people and what they're achieving, what you think their life is like, 
you hop on social media and you see all these people who you think are having wonderful lives and you can't help but compare yourself. But it's important to be cognizant of the fact that you're doing it. Instead of thinking what's he or she doing, turn it into what am I doing? Focus back within yourself. If you catch yourself doing it, turn it back on you. What am I doing? What should I be doing? What could I be doing? What have I done today? Instead of constantly comparing yourselves. Set goals for yourself and beat yourself. Don't worry about what others are doing. Unless it's unsafe and you need to report it. Do what you will with that statement. You know what I mean. Something that really helped me was transition activities. So it was before heading into the hospital and after leaving the hospital, I would listen to, I had a playlist, I would listen to um, podcasts, perhaps it's a book. As catching the bus was part of my transport to and from leaving the hospital, that's the time I would count as transitioning. My mind from that work mindset of I need to do this, this and this, or constantly thinking about clients and how they're going and trying to take some time for myself to try and recuperate and refill my energy and my compassion levels. Your kindness, your, your critical thinking skills, all the things that you need to be an amazing clinician. Take time to refill this. This might be through doing something that seems mindless to some people. Something repetitive can be quite soothing. Could be knitting, crocheting, painting, running, kicking a ball back and forth. Find something that you can easily slot into your day, that you can do regularly, that helps you relax. It could be listening to guided meditations on YouTube. It could be listening to piano music. It could be having a dance party in your bathroom. So positive strategies. It's taking those breaks. It's having that good old healthy diet, whatever that looks like and what you believe that to be. It's about taking time with your friends and family and talking about things other than work. It can be hard sometimes. Having interests and hobbies that are outside of your work as well. It can be participating and be involved in supervision or debriefings, team meetings, updating your colleagues, checking in on your colleagues and establishing this type of culture within your workplace where you can bring up things of how you're going and ask for support and offer support to your team members. It's important that we're looking for stress and burnout in our colleagues as well as ourselves. It's important for us to be focusing on prevention, remembering self-care isn't an emergency fix but something that needs to happen ongoing to build up your capacity to take on and work through stressful situations or tasks. I wanted to finish today's video with some advice from my fellow occupational therapists. I reached out to a few friends in my course to see what advice they had in general and about a few different areas from their experiences on placement. So I'll read you their advice now and I might elaborate on some of the points as we go. So firstly, don't be hard on yourself. You're a student clinician, so don't compare yourself to highly experienced clinicians around you. Draw on their experience. Use your placement to really gather as much advice, information, shadow and watch what is so great about them and what skills and tricks that they've learned over the years that make them so great with their clients and in their work in general. Remember that with practice, commitment, hard work and all that, you can get there too next piece of advice make sure you take breaks spend weekends doing self-care tasks hmm. <laughs> on topic I found going outside and walking around the botanical gardens to be really helpful they say have a regular sleep schedule which we already know is really important as you'll feel exhausted from day one definitely check out I'll put my vlog from my first um, days on placement I was exhausted <laughs> If you have your self-care under control, you're less likely to burn out before the end of placement. You'll also find it easier to remember everything that happens during the day if you feel more energised. That's definitely something that uh, happens to me all the time. I feel tired and I cannot remember what's happened during the day. Simple question is, how's your day been? Usually leaves me sitting there in silence contemplating, where have I been the past 10 hours? 
Next piece of advice. Sometimes things happen in placement that'll really upset you. One of my patients passed away while I was on placement and I found it really hard to cope with that. Don't be afraid to reach out to your support network and your clinical educator, supervising officer, so whoever that is relevant to you, who's in charge of the clinical placements at your hospital and your university for help and advice. I spoke to my CISO and she provided me with resources for self-care and resiliency, which were really helpful. So that's a big thing, reaching out, doing your own research, but really what's coming through here is the importance of self-care and how having those strategies already in place or a bank of activities you could go to can really be helpful in the type of work we do. Number four, this probably applies to every setting that an OT deals with, but one of the most emotionally challenging things I found about working in this setting was seeing very complex medical and social situations all around you. And in my third or fourth week, my CE clinical educator said to me, remember that this isn't the norm. Remember that you're seeing the most acute cases and that helped me snap out of it. It sounds wild, but I started thinking that all babies have complications and most families have domestic violence, but that's just not true. So I think this person was working in um, acute pediatrics. Number five, with any placement, make sure you're taking some time for yourself daily and weekly. And as much as possible, when you leave at the end of the day, switch off from placement. That's good. One of my friends said that when she left the hospital, she would take off her swiper with her ID and that would symbolize that she is switched from work until when she puts it on the next morning. So that's another transition strategy or transition activity. I like that. Have people you can go to and debrief, in brackets, in a private space for confidentiality. Yes. <laughs> Number six, self-care is so important. Should have started with this one. <laughs> Your placement might be fun and breezy, but it can also be overwhelming. Make sure during your weeks of placement, you do things that refill your tank. You can talk to your supervisor if you don't feel like you're coping, and they will know what to do to support you. And if you feel like um, perhaps the first person you talked to didn't have a lot of information or they didn't really maybe understand what you're trying to get across, don't stop there. Reach out to someone else, perhaps at your university, perhaps someone in a different discipline, a physio, a speechy, um, psychologist, a social worker. If you're lucky enough to work in an MDT, perhaps asking for advice across disciplines could be extremely valuable. Number seven, last but not least, you don't have to love all of your placements. Some of them you can just survive and that's okay. That might sound like a kind of bleak, sad piece of advice, but sometimes you're going to be put in a setting or sometimes you're just going to have a day that wasn't great and it's okay. That's, that's life. You know, those days, those weeks, sometimes they're going to happen, but it's what you do with the negative. It's how you then leave work and make the rest of your day better or productive. Maybe it's similar to when you're on a diet or you're trying to follow or be healthy um, and you have a cheat meal. You know, people say cheat meals. You know, I had, I had a piece of cake. I wasn't supposed to have any sugar. My diet's over, I've ruined it, I have to wait till next year. I'm pretty sure lots of people say, like, health, gym, diety, fitness, health, nutritional people, nutritional people. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of these people say, get back on it. Don't wait until the next day to fix your diet again, to fix your nutrition. Start from that next meal. Take that time, do what you need. If it's taking five, 10 minutes, going for a walk, debriefing, sitting in silence. For me, it's being by myself for five, 10 minutes and then getting back to it. That can be hard. It's about what you do with the rest of the day, the rest of the week. So that's my overview of self-care and its importance to us as student clinicians, new graduates, 
or occupational therapists or health clinicians in general. I hope you took something away from this video. Let us know your experiences, your advice. Do you have some work to home, transitioning activities? What does your self-care routine like? You've got lots to say down below, I'm sure. Thank you so much for watching this video. It means the world to me. Follow me on Twitter. I sometimes post things. I don't, yep, mm-hmm. Um, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.